And there's just something powerful about a stage full of high school students leading worship. Wasn't that great this morning? I mean, <clears throat> except for Alan Glor, who's about the same height as them. That was all students. It was, it was incredible. Um, and Alan is a, is a great leader. Uh, and so thankful for them. Uh, my name is Mark Phillips. I'm the student minister here at Oakwood. And it's my honor to be able to speak with all of you this morning. If you would, please bow and pray with me before we jump in. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the gift of your word and the truth that is contained within it. Thank you, Father, for these graduates that we get to recognize, and Father, hopefully, by what is said and done here today, you would receive honor and glory, that we would focus on you and your son, Jesus. You were good to us, and most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Amen. In Hong Kong, political democracy was saved by yellow umbrellas in 2014. The government had been considering proposals to change the electoral system of the country. The young adults of Hong Kong were widely against these reforms. They were fearful for the future of their country, and they decided to do something about it. They arranged peaceful protests and sit-ins to display to the government that the people did not want these changes made to their democratic system and that they were fearful of the communistic mindset infiltrating their country. Their protests overwhelmed the law enforcement. The highest number of active protesters was around 100,000 people. The sit-ins persisted for 77 days. The protesters purchased yellow umbrellas, at first to use as a shield from the raining pepper spray from law enforcement. But eventually, the yellow umbrellas became a symbol of their movement. The majority of these protesters were in their early 20s. Together, the young adults and college students in Hong Kong took a stance against their political system. Now, that's just one of many examples of people in our graduates' age range doing something amazing or even impossible in the world today. Facebook, Snapchat, Reddit, Dropbox, and ModCloth are all companies that have something in common. They were all created by college students. Young adults are actively changing our world. They're saving democracy, and they're starting companies. Many of our graduates who have walked or will walk across a stage soon are making contributions to society. But where do you begin? And if you, I'm looking here because they're, they're all sitting, right, these are our graduates, we're, they're all right here. Got them sitting right here. So if you see me focus on them, that's why I'm like, who are those in the front? Uh, that's them, right? And, and as graduation has come and gone for some of you and is happening, you might be thinking, well, now What? What advice could I give you, said actress Mindy Kaling. Celebrities give too much advice and people listen to it too much. Most of us have no education whatsoever. Who should be giving the advice? And the answer is people like you. You're better educated. You're going to go out into the world and people are going to listen to what you say. Whether you are good or evil, and that probably scares you because some of you look really young. Bible scholars believe that many of the disciples met Jesus when they were around our graduates' age. They spent three years following around the Savior of the world. They watched him die. They saw him resurrected, and then they watched him ascend into heaven. And I'm sure the disciples, like our graduates, may be asking themselves, now what? The disciples' transition into life without their training wheels is a model for how we, especially our graduates, can live our lives as we walk into the next season of life. See, the disciples had to wait for what was next. They had to wait for what was next. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 says, starting verse 9, after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took them out of sight, took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood before them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? 
The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now this, this scripture paints the picture of the disciples actually watching Jesus ascend into heaven with their own eyes. And, and this is different from previous instances in scripture where someone just disappears. You see, Jesus didn't disappear. He, he wasn't taken up into heaven by a fiery chariot like Elijah. No, Jesus, under no power except his own, ascends into heaven. And the disciples are standing there watching, right? And as he rose, a cloud hid them from, hid him from their sight. Now, you remember being a kid with a helium balloon, right? And you go outside and you have your helium balloon. And, and if you're not meaning to let it go, now that I have children, I've learned. If you have a helium balloon and you're a child and you let it go, but you didn't mean to, it is the absolute end of the world. <laughs> Everything else is just gone. That balloon was life for that child, and now it's ruined, right? You can't, ice cream doesn't help, candy, nothing. Like, you want to hug? Never! Like, it is unreal. But if you have that helium balloon and you mean to let it go, do you remember doing this? Yeah, the helium balloon, and you let it go, and you watch it, and it got really high, and then you'd like squint, because I can still see it, it's still up there. And then eventually it gets to that point where you can't actually see the balloon. You think you can see the balloon, so you're just staring into the sky. Everyone around you is like, Who, what is he doing? <laughs> oh, there it is. All right? Uh, that's, I imagine, what was happening with the disciples, right? They're watching Jesus. Peter grabbed a rope, tried to tie it around his foot, the first balloon. I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I imagine the disciples are watching Jesus ascend, and they start squinting. I can still see him. I can still see him. And then, as if to break the awkward silence that the disciples had, two angels in dazzling white clothing standing among them. It's a pretty um, incredible scene, right? They're watching Jesus just past that moment where they, they can't see him anymore. Dead silence in their group, right? Their leader, their friend, their teacher is gone. Now what? They're catching the last glimpse of Jesus in the flesh on earth. And when they finally look down, the two angels are there among them. They seem to interrupt the disciples and kind of call them out. And they're like, hey, you know, look at verse 11 again in Acts 1. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who is taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that he is going into heaven. The angels were like the gun that fires to signal the start of a track race. It's the closest experience, I think, that the disciples had to a graduation. Now, maybe they're not going to walk across a stage like some of you have or will, but this was the beginning of the next chapter of their life. For the disciples, the past three years had been prepping them for life after Jesus would leave them. The disciples had to take what they had learned and apply it now that they were on their own. Graduates, you are in a very similar spot. Uh, Your education, your experience, everything you've learned and gained to this point has been to prep you for what you're about to encounter. And like the disciples, you're asking, so now what? Now, we can learn many things about how to continue from this point on from the disciples, right? The first thing, Jesus has empowered you to proclaim his name wherever you go. Jesus has empowered you to proclaim him wherever you go. The very last thing Jesus said on earth, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The last instruction Jesus gave was go. Go. And and the disciples took that seriously. In fact, historical documents and tradition have led us to understand that all the disciples, except for one, were brutally murdered because of their faith. Brutally killed. Because they took the command of Jesus seriously to go and tell people about Jesus. 
We as followers of Jesus likely see the need to spread the gospel, but in reality, do we actually do anything about it? Graduates, you're walking into a fresh season of life. Whether you're going to the workforce or military or continuing your education, you are getting a clean slate somewhere. You're starting over as an adult, and and you can be anything you want to be. You can shake old generalizations about yourself. Uh, You can create new and better things for which to be known. You can decide to be the person who actively lives out their faith. You can decide to be the person who freely shares the truth of the gospel that changed your life with everyone you meet. I mean, this is how the disciples lived. They took the command Jesus gave all of us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, seriously. We as followers of Jesus need to take it seriously too. Charles Spurgeon, famous preacher, once said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Let me say that one more time. Charles Spurgeon once said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. When the disciples were graduating into the next season of their life and their ministries, they relied on prayer as a roadmap for their decisions. So the second thing that we can learn from the disciples is that prayer is critical to discovering what's next. Prayer is critical to discovering what's next. As we read earlier, the disciples were transfixed on the sky after Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus had left, but they knew he was going to come back. But when? When is that going to happen? Like a few minutes? A few months? Like when is that going to happen? Well, what do we do now? What next? Well, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They were all there. They were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So during the ten days uh, between the ascension until the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come, Jesus' followers, about 120 people at this point, gathered together in an upstairs room in a home in Jerusalem, And here's what they did. They prayed while they waited. They prayed. They didn't know what their next move was going to be, so so they got together, they prayed, and they waited. I I wish that prayer was my instinctive response when I have a lack of clarity. Maybe you're similar in that regard. That when you lack clarity in a situation... Maybe you wish your immediate response would be prayer. Unfortunately, I think when we're often faced with difficult choices, we stress, and then we choose the option that we like the best. Then we take what we have decided, or what we hope will happen, and we pray those words to God, seeking his affirmation of what we want. God, bless what I want, because that's probably what you want, right? See, we don't actually go to God first and ask him, what should I do? We decide on our own without God, this is what's going to happen. God, make it so. As if he's the genie who grants our wishes. The disciples took a very different approach. See, they took this season of transition as an opportunity for God to speak loudly into the what next of their life. They were solely relying on God's instruction for direction. We read this in the book of Isaiah. The Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land, and strengthen your bones. They trusted that God would give them what was next. So how do we trust God for his direction in our lives? How how do our graduates know what path is God's path? In Matthew, we're challenged by these words of Jesus. Anyone 
who finds his life will lose it. But anyone who loses his life because of me will find it. Graduates, seek Jesus. Listen to him, talk to him, spend time in his word. If we're constantly looking for ways to align our lives with Jesus, you'll never have to worry about being on his path or not. Which is a truth for all of us. When it's a tough decision at work and family, when things unexpected pop up, as they always do, and you're wondering, what is God's path? What, what would Jesus have me do in this scenario? Align yourself with him. Listen to him. Be in his word. And you'll never have to worry if you're off track or not. Because the closer you get to him, the closer you are on the path. The disciples encountered some pretty harsh moments themselves. If you've read anything from their life, they understood persecution. They understood harsh moments and tough decisions. But God was always with them every step of the way. And he will remain by your side as well. Part of the disciples' strength came from one another in the community of believers in the first century. So here's the third thing we learn from the disciples is that you need a community of believers. You need it. Right? You can do more as a community than you could ever do alone. The first century church knew this. Look at this in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold all their possessions and property and they distributed it. All the proceeds as anyone had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So let's set the stage a little bit for this passage, right? Um, after 3,000 conversions in one day, 3,000 people accepted Jesus in one day. So right after that, Jerusalem finds itself with a strong fellowship of young believers. Jesus in the flesh had not been gone from the earth very long. The majority of this group of believers was young in their faith. They, they didn't know as much as they probably wanted to know about Jesus, but they truly wanted to know him better. They were passionate about living lives that would honor Jesus. They spent time with one another. They studied and they prayed together. They, they took communion and they worshiped together. They even put their money where their mouth was and they sold all their stuff so that no one would be wanting. It was as if one person in the community's problem was the team's problem. I kind of wish we could get back to that a little bit. How often in the church do we hear this where someone has a need? Oh man, this, this terrible thing happened. Oh man, I'll pray for you. And don't get me wrong, prayer is powerful. But I think there's something to be learned when we read that the early church, in all of its persecution and terrible circumstances, would take the security that we often find in our bank accounts and say, no, this is more important. The church, the kingdom, is more important. And it's amazing when it happens, because it still does. The disciples were thrust into an entirely new world when Jesus left. They looked to one another for support. Then they invited everyone they met to come along with them on their journey. We need to do the same. All of us need to belong to a strong community of believers. Graduates, many of you are going to new places over the next couple of years. Wherever you land, wherever you land, find a community of believers. Grow with them. 
Lean into them. You need it, as we all do. In the Bible, we read about the value of community. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. And this from Matthew chapter 18, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We need one another. We need people to encourage in their faith. And we need to encourage others in their faith. God did not design us to go through life alone. When God created you, his intention was not for you to try to figure this out by yourself. Graduates, you are all titans of community. You can actually open a few apps on your phone and and, um, you can count the friends that you have on a daily, almost hourly basis, right? And that's amazing in a world that a a lot of people just a few years older than you are still pretty baffled by, right? Um, You all can mobilize thousands of people with just a few keystrokes. What a tool and a gift that you have in your hand. But please, Please understand that the digital community is a fake reality. It will never fulfill or replace actual, real life, person-to-person, face-to-face relationships. It never will. And you've noticed it's starting to be called, you know, the online community. But it is a fake reality. Do not allow that to try and take the place of real community in your life. See, I hope that you use your technology to contact and to spur people on to faith. I I hope that you get creative and you create and you do things that are going to just blow us all away. But I also hope you understand that there's something special that God designed for real community. See, the, the early church, they didn't have smartphones. So, so we don't actually have a road map uh, of how they would have utilized today's technology. However, we do know that they actually lived life together. Instead of just commenting or liking a post, they went through things together. They were there in the moment. Find other believers to truly exist with as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Your faith was not designed to be a solo sport. So here are the three things that we said already. Share Jesus with others. Pray for God's direction and invest in a community of believers. This isn't just good advice for our graduates. It is. But it's also a formula for how all of us can look more and more like Jesus. Share him often. Pray for God's direction and invest in a community of believers. Today, we get the honor to honor our graduates. And every year, I I love this opportunity to come up with a sermon that hopefully is an encouragement and a sending for our graduates, but also something that all of us can walk away with. Um, And I hope that that's been what it is for you today. That as you see these young lives who are going off and doing incredible things, that you would understand your role here and now. That there is a generation of worship leaders preachers, of youth ministers and children's ministers, of elders and deacons and plumbers and electricians and lawyers and presidents who need someone to invest in them, who need someone to show them what Jesus looks like. And that's you. 
It's mom and dad. It's uncle and aunt. It's grandma and grandpa. It's friend. It's anybody who loves Jesus. Invest. So what we're going to do now is honor some pretty incredible students. And what I like to do every year is um, really honor them. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say their name, and, and you all have an active role today. When I say their name, I want you to, you know, because at every graduation, the, the really important guy always gets up and says, please hold your applause so everyone can. No, that's malarkey. I want you to cheer as loud as you can, like they just won the Super Bowl by themselves, right? I want them to feel your cheers, all right, like in their chest, okay? So when I say their name, I want you to just let loose and, and have at it. So to make sure we're all on the same page, Let's just get a, let's get a practice one in, because I don't want the first one to be like, uh, yeah, no. I want, let's, let's get after, all right? So I'm going to count from three downwards, and then when I hit zero, just have at it, all right? Here we go, ready? Three, two, one, go. That's good. That was good. Congratulations. That's never happened on the first try of anything in church history, ever. That was amazing. So here we go. Without further uh, stalling, our first graduate is Luke Morris. <laughs> so Luke uh, gradu graduated already from Enid High School. He's attended Oakwood for 13 years. Holy cow. His favorite memory from high school is weekends having his friends over. His favorite memory from student ministry or for, from church is uh, one of my favorite memories from student ministry was the first time that I went to CIY Move. I was moved to donate money to help people earn houses with one mission rather than accept gifts for my 16th birthday. Our, uh, Luke is graduating uh, with some honors. He's an Eagle Scout, an Adobe uh, Certificate recipient, state champion team for Skills USA. He plans to attend Oklahoma Baptist University and study graphic design. And uh, favorite life verse or significant quote for him, always try to see past differences because ultimately we're all human. Our next graduate is Landry Carr. <laughs> Landry is also a graduate of Enid High School. He's attended Oakwood for three years. His favorite memory from high school is, all right, everyone get ready, taking my sisters to school my senior year. Oh, that is lovely. His favorite uh, memory uh, from church is actually attending weekly with his parents. Um, he is still figuring out what's happening next, and his significant uh, life verse is we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Our next graduate is Christian McGugan. Christian is also a graduate of Enid High School. He's attended Oakwood for three years. His favorite memory from high school is... Sticking a sandwich to the cafeteria pillar. <laughs> so, quality education. <laughs> His favorite memory from student ministry or church is dr drinking awful true moo milk and having Pringles shoved in his face on the way to CIY. He is graduating as a National Honor Society uh, and he also got president and honors role. Uh, he plans to uh, attend UCO in the fall and uh, pursue a degree of music. His favorite life verse is, wherever you go, there you are, Don Jacks. <laughs> Our next graduate is Kelly Carr. <laughs> 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 
Kelly is also a graduate of Enid High. He's attended uh, Oakwood for two or three years. His most, uh, uh, his favorite memory from high school, the time Luke Morris and I spent an hour getting a shopping cart out of the creek and then painted it gold. Your favorite memory from student ministry or church, putting a stack of Pringles in Christian's mouth on the way to CIY. He is graduating with honors. He didn't list them, but they're honors. All right. um, he plans to attend Southeastern Oklahoma State University and major in zoology. His favorite uh, life verse or significant quote, to get men to do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they want to achieve. Tom Landry. Our next graduate is Peyton Easterly. <laughs> Peyton is a graduate of Epic Online Charter School. She's attended Oakwood for two years. Her favorite memory from high school was prom. Uh, her favorite memory from student ministry was being able to attend CIY her very first time. Um, she is still working out her plans, but her favorite life verse is Romans 6, 23. And our final, not least, graduate is Audrey Jacks. <laughs> Audrey is a graduate of Enid High School. She has attended Oakwood for three years. Her favorite memory from high school is having fun with friends in class. Her favorite memory uh, from student ministry is the band, worship band, hanging out at middle school camp last year. She is graduating with honors and valedictorian commendation. She plans to attend the University of Tulsa in the fall and study speech language pathology. And her, first, her favorite life verse is 1 Timothy 4.12. Let's give it up one more time for our graduates. They are a, an incredible group and have made a, an incredible impact on not just the student ministry, but this church as a whole. And we're so excited to send you out into this world. It's, it's hard because we don't want to see you go, but it's also filling because we get to see what you're going to do. And we know that you have been trained. And it's a special moment because we get to see the change that you will make as God guides you and as he leads you. Don't forget where you've come from, but also look ahead 